as a result of the population disaster brought about by the Columbian Exchange, European colonists to the Americas often found open fields waiting for their farmers and well-fed herds of game animals waiting for their hunters. In Central and South America, the Spanish built cities like Mexico City and Cusco right on top of the native cities that they replaced. Because most of the Spaniards in the New World were soldiers, women were often taken from native communities to be wives and mistresses. One high-ranking Inca native and survivor of the conquest named Felipe Guauman Pomo de Ayala wrote to the King of Spain about 1600, complaining that the Spaniards were taking all of the Indian women of childbearing age so that the place was being flooded with mestizos, people of mixed ethnicity, who were not required to do the work that the Indians were required to do. Worse, the fathers were not supporting their illegitimate children. And Ayala said, if a Spaniard steals away four Indian women to make little mestizos, he will bribe the judges and refuse to recognize his paternity, leaving their support up to the state. Spaniards ought to behave like Christians, Ayala argued marrying ladies of equal status and leaving the poor Indian women alone so they can have Indian children. Most of the countries of Latin America were built on mixed or mestizo populations, so much so that it became important for the colonists to try to make distinctions between all these various types of people that they believed made up their societies. Although these distinctions were somewhat arbitrary and mostly were used to uphold the power of the group at the top, in the long run, many of these mixed Euro-American populations have developed very strong ethnic identities. A similar process happened to our north in New France. There were only about 2,500 French people in the province of Quebec by 1663. And most of them were voyageurs, fur traders who went out into the northern forests to make their fortune. Voyageurs frequently married local native women and their Canadian descendants are now recognized as a distinct ethno-cultural group called Métis. The social caste system developed in Latin America was based on both blood and on origin. At the top were the Peninsulares, Spaniards born in Spain on the Iberian Peninsula. Next were the Criollos, Creoles, and these are Spaniards of full Spanish blood but born in the colonies. And beneath them are the mestizos, the people of mixed race. And then at the bottom, Indians. Later, when the colonies started importing African slaves, new designations like mulatto and zambo were developed to describe the children of black, white, or black Indian unions. Over time, this caste system became very elaborate and very confusing. But as I said, more recently, these varied ethnicities have resulted in very distinctive communities and now contribute to the cultural diversity of the Americas. The Portuguese were initially more interested in dominating trade routes in the Indian Ocean, so they didn't spend that much effort and energy on their new possession of Brazil until they noticed that the Spanish had brought sugarcane into the Caribbean and were having some success there. Sugar, which both the Spanish and the Portuguese had learned to grow and process in the Middle East from Muslims during the First Crusade, was already a profitable product in Portugal's island colonies like the Azores off the African coast. Portuguese entrepreneurs brought cane and slaves to Brazil to set up plantations like the ones that they had near Africa. They needed African slaves because the Indian populations had either died out or were always running away into the interior jungles where the Portuguese were afraid to pursue them. Luckily for Portugal, they already had a ready supply of enslaved Africans to draw. Slavery had been a traditional element of African society from time immemorial, but it got substantially worse under European control. African slaves were usually war captives or debtors. They oftentimes gained positions in the societies that captured them, and their children were generally born free. That changed when the Portuguese established the first European colony in sub-Saharan Africa, which they called Angola in 1575. 
Now, you may be wondering if they had such a head start, why the Spanish didn't continue to dominate the Americas and become a permanent world empire. One of the reasons, as I've already alluded to, was the politics of Europe and the money that the Spanish spent to try to combat the Protestant Reformation. In Europe, Spanish wealth began to cause problems. Wealthy Spanish nobles married into aristocratic families like the Austrian Habsburgs. In 1519, the same year that Cortes attacked Tenochtitlan and Magellan set out to circle the earth, the grandson of Ferdinand and Isabella, Charles V, was elected Holy Roman Emperor. Charles had also become King of Spain three years earlier and was King of Portugal by marriage, which gave him legal control over all the American colonies. When his wife, Isabella of Portugal, died in 1555, Charles was inconsolable. He abdicated both thrones in 1556 and retired to a monastery, leaving his younger brother Ferdinand in charge of the Holy Roman Empire in Europe and his son Philip II in control of Spain and Portugal and their possessions, which also included the Low Countries of the European coast. Philip II was also King of England briefly while he was married to Queen Mary, who we know as Bloody Mary. She died in 1558. Then he lost control of the Protestant Dutch Republic, although he tried for decades to hang on to it. And Spain declared bankruptcy five times. Spain's financial troubles were partly due to debts that Charles V had left, that he had accumulated as the Holy Roman Emperor, trying to prevent the spread of Protestantism. After Queen Mary's death, Philip had proposed to her successor, Elizabeth I in England, but she had turned him down. Philip then supported Mary, Queen of Scots, claim to the British throne because she also was a Catholic. But when she was executed in 1587, Philip decided to invade and to reclaim England for the church. The Spanish Armada was hampered by bad weather on the English Channel, and then it was defeated by the British Royal Navy, which lost no ships, while Spain lost five before withdrawing. And then during its retreat, most of the Spanish Navy was destroyed by storms, leaving the British and the Dutch in control of the Atlantic. Later that year, the English Royal Navy sailed into the harbor at Cadiz and burned 200 Spanish ships and made off with the annual silver shipment. Another reason that Spain didn't permanently dominate the European economy and become a permanent global empire was that for centuries, most of the silver that they shipped from Peru and Mexico ultimately ended up in China, where silver was the basis, you recall, for the Earth's largest economy. And buoyed by China's economic dominance, Asian population actually increased from 60% of the world's people in 1500 to fully 67%, two-thirds by 1800. In addition to the Ming in China, the Mughals in India also ruled an empire of 150 million people, and they were very interested in expanding trade with the West. India was also highly productive. Between the two nations, Asia produced 80% of all the world's goods. Chinese silks and Indian cottons were the world's best and lowest cost textiles, and clothes made from them were worn throughout the world, even in Spain's colonies, where the law required people to trade only with the home country. The traditional national costume of Mexico is called the China Poblana. It was originally a contraband silk dress that was worn by the women of the Puebla, and trying to protect the nation's domestic industries was not limited to Spain. The British were also intimidated by Asian textiles, and they imposed tariffs to try to protect their own weavers from being driven out of business. I'll talk about that in a later chapter. But the point is, mercantilism was not actually a primitive economic system that evolved into free market capitalism. It was an attempt to shield British and European merchants from an actual free market in which they were too often the losers. But that is all for now. So, thanks for listening. Hope you found that interesting. I'll see you again next time.
But before you go, one more series of questions for discussion. First, why were the Spanish so interested and concerned about pure blood and about tracing the various degrees of ethnicity in their colonies? Second, what were the four major caste status levels in colonial society? Third, how did the dynastic politics of Europe affect these American colonies? And then finally, why was Asia so important to colonial America? Now I've reached the end for this chapter. So I do appreciate your listening. Thank you, and I will see you again next time.